Imagine if you would, D-Day, June 6th, 1944, but a very different D-Day from the one we know from history. Infantry land from landing craft, and of course tanks are brought ashore, familiar Shermans and Churchills. But in this alternate view of D-Day, T-34s and perhaps KV-1s as well. No, I'm not saying that the Soviets would have been involved in D-Day, but there were serious considerations given to the cloning and mass production of Soviet tanks by the Western Allies. The British in particular were very interested in the T-34. Sometimes, when watching footage of the Titanic struggle on the Eastern Front in World War II, you might notice that the Red Army's use of British and American tanks seemed to have been fairly widespread. Despite its enormous manufacturing capability, the USSR nonetheless received a lot of material assistance from its British and American allies. The British began the process by sending the Soviets Valentine tanks. Eventually, Britain and Canada supplied half of those they manufactured, shipping a total of 3,762 Valentine tanks to the Soviet Union. Many of these Valentines saw action in the desperate battles outside Moscow to stop the Germans in December 1941 and the Soviets were impressed by the Valentine, despite its numerous problems, described by them as a small but powerful British tank. The scale of British aid to the Soviet Union was enormous. As well as the tanks, the British also supplied Stalin with 3,000 aircraft, 70 million rounds of small arms ammunition, 40,000 tons of boots, 50,000 tons of rubber, and 85,000 trucks, not to mention 831,000 tons of raw materials, machine tools, and small arms. Not bad for a nation in fairly dire straits itself in the early part of the war, and fighting for its very existence. And the United States extended its Lend-Lease program to the USSR. The figures are fairly astounding. The United States supplied goods and weapons to Stalin between 1941 and 45, valued in 1945 dollars at 11.3 billion, or at today's prices, 180 billion dollars. By the end of June 1944, the US had shipped to the Soviets 11,000 aircraft, over 6,000 tanks and tank destroyers, and 300,000 trucks and other vehicles. From the United States, the Red Army received in particular the M4A2 Sherman, some 4,000 examples in all. But perhaps we also don't realize today that such cooperation went both ways. The Western Allies were very interested in Soviet tanks, specifically the KV-1 and the T-34. And what is not known widely today is the fact that the British government seriously considered cloning and mass-producing Soviet tanks to re-equip the British army. The Soviets sent the Americans and British examples of both tank types, which were put through a stringent, detailed and rigorous test and evaluation process, and detailed reports were written up afterwards. The Americans were not very happy with the Soviet tanks. They were not very impressed, believing that the designs of both the KV-1 and the T-34 were obsolescent, with shoddy transmissions and flawed armour. They also didn't like the wide tracks. The width of Soviet tanks was also a problem for the British. One of the limiting factors for the size of British tanks was the width of British railway rolling stock. The railway gauge was 4 feet 8.5 inches, with a maximum wagon width of 9 feet, in order to get through tunnels. The T-34 was 9 feet 10 inches wide. However, this was not an insurmountable problem for the British to overcome. For example, the Churchill tank was 10 feet 8 inches wide, 
so the British were able to transport such wide loads when they had to, along special routes. The Soviets, who travelled to Britain with the tanks during the evaluation process, came away with the idea that the British definitely intended to build a clone of the T-34, armed with a 17-pounder gun, and the KV-1, mounting a 6-inch howitzer. They would have improved gearboxes and differential clutches, and would be equipped with centrifugal air filters that would draw air from the transmission compartment, and the armour welding seams would be improved to make them as robust as the tank's armour plates. The Soviets definitely thought the projects would go ahead. The Soviet report states, quote, The fact that the English expect to produce our tanks is almost not hidden from us. This was established in conversations with workers at the Scientific Investigative Tank Proving Grounds and is backed up by other evidence. For example, when visiting an English gun factory near Liverpool, journalist, whose name is unintelligible in the report, was informed that the factory is getting ready to produce 17-pounder guns for T-34 tanks that the English will soon produce. End quote. The British certainly had a higher opinion of the T-34 and KV-1 than their US allies, and the Soviets noted in early 1944 that the British had a requirement for a tank now, with the Centurion still under development, and it would in fact be too late to actually see combat in World War II. As a stopgap measure, the T-34 would have, in the opinion of the Soviets, given Britain a decent tank that they could have got into production fairly quickly, any problems and faults ironed out, and somehow a 17-pounder gun accommodated in the T-34's turret. It has been argued since the war that, as regards reliability, the T-34 was probably no worse than existing British tanks of the cruiser series before the introduction of the Comet, which came right at the end of the war. However, ultimately, the British continued to use more and more US tanks, for example, fitting the 17-pounder gun to the Sherman to create the Firefly. This is the same powerful 17-pounder that was going to be fitted to British T-34s. Probably the biggest reason why the T-34 wasn't adopted by the British in some shape or form was, as I mentioned, the tank's width compared with British railways. The design could have been made narrower, perhaps to the detriment of performance. Apart from probably fitting British Meteor engines and gearboxes, British tanks also required individual radios, so the T-34's turret would have to have been enlarged to accommodate the radio equipment, perhaps losing some of the sloping armour protection. In the end, however, nothing came of these tests. The British did not adopt either the T-34 or the KV-1. and stuck to their own homegrown designs for American tanks. Whether that was the right or the wrong decision is something I'm sure many of you will enjoy arguing about in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share. Also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.